Ah. Uh. Mama. Mama. We made it. What it, what it, what it do to? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Mama We Made It podcast. And today we have the epitome of a mind of a genius with us, y'all. Ooh. Mr. David Dan in the building. What's up? What's up? What's up? I wish y'all could see this setup right now. Because not only did David stroll up in here, flip flops on, swiggy swaggling. He had his pokey from poking me on Westwood. And then he brought his hookah so he can just be nice and comfortable. David is like the hookah king for those that don't know. If you ever want to find a way to David Dan's heart, Have a hookah figure right. a fucking way to incorporate a hookah into the scenario and you'll be straight. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. David Dan, welcome to the Mama We Made It podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, a little disclaimer before we start. So this actually is the second one we're recording because the first one you guys fucked up the audio. Yes. Yes, so, yes, um, let them know. So this one will actually be better than the first. It'll That's be a right. lot better. Because we've already had a three-hour in-length discussion. That I mean, look, what, what, what people don't know is that like you've been my son for like about, uh, what, yeah. six years? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about the couch you slept on. In my you know what I'm saying? Oh. I mean, <laughs> hey. <laughs> All right. No, I love you to death. You know this. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people know where you are right now. Um, got one of the most incredible independent labels on the scene, Mind of a Genius. You you guys have been able to do some things that you know the industry alone never thought was possible, and and it's it's gorgeous to see you at the helm of it. Your vision, um, uh, coming to life more and more each day. I want to take people back, uh, to the beginning with you, and really talk about the story that led up to this. Because there was a lot of things in your journey that's led up to you not only being able to do this, but being so masterful at it and being able to so tastefully and artfully do this and set this up and put yourself in a position to really dominate this music sphere. Um, take us back to you know what music meant to you as a kid and, and, and when it really started to hit you. Um, yeah, totally. Um when I was about eight or nine, um, I remember being in my mom's car and sort of driving around with her, doing her things, or me getting dropped off at school, or you know, basic stuff. And she, in her car, in the old Lexuses, they used to have like the knobs that would stick out mm. that are now sort of digitalized, and you would control like the bass, the treble, yeah. and I was infatuated with the way that you could control audio in the car, you know, by lowering like the dynamics of sound. And I would always like mess around with that in the car. And, um, again, that was like, I guess one of my first moments of just loving, like messing with sound, but it wasn't until I was forced into playing piano at like around 12 or 13 years old when I realized that that moment, it meant a lot more than just, enjoyment or a hobby or pleasure so you were forced to play yeah was it like I was, the persian parents that threw the the piano on you? yeah well i had i had um you know persian jewish mother syndrome mm. um which was basically i like, love her to death though yeah trying to make me do whether it was like sports or piano or um growing up throwing me into a bunch of different things like that and <clears throat> the second i started playing piano it was like a a moment where i realized that i couldn't step away mm -hmm. um and piano you know at that moment really like the keys and the feeling i got from just sitting down um was and is still probably the most intimate feeling that i can have yeah um in any type of you know situation whether it's with people or um otherwise but when i started playing piano that's when i realized that i really like i was just stuck yeah, that's awesome. You know, because I feel a lot of people that are forced to play piano um, actually don't enjoy it or it's kind of your standard piano lessons that you just have to go through. And then you kind of kick it. But um, you felt an intimate bond with that out the gate. Yeah. Um, 
you know, by I was I was playing. I had lessons for like a year and a half, mm -hmm. and I was within a year and a half playing recitals with people that had been playing five plus years. Mm -hmm. And you know, my teacher was proud. My mom was obviously proud. And the lessons were really expensive. Yeah. Um, and I also didn't love being taught how to play an instrument at that point when I was sort of naturally playing for myself. Okay. Um, so I ended up quitting the teacher after about a year and a half and I continued to just sort of compose and play, um, for myself really. And it wasn't really about like getting good yeah. at the master of playing piano, mm -hmm. but more, it's more so, expression based. Yeah. Like we always had something funny in my house where like my mom would know exactly how I felt when I played piano at the house. We had a, like a really small apartment growing up. Yeah. So like I would try to get there or I try to play when nobody was there because mm. it was, again, it was such an intimate thing for me. And it still is today. Um, but yeah, you know, definitely the, the gateway to everything else was, um, started through the piano. Were you songwriting too at that time? Did that like start making sense or was it just kind of improvisation when you went off on your own or did you have like, okay, let me <coughs> think about st structuring a song or playing with melodies. What kind of stuck with you at that melodies. point? Melodies. Yeah. Melodies. It was like, um, you know, obviously like in my blood, the roots of Persian, uh, heritage is very like emotional and mm. the melodies even in like Persian songs are all very like in lyrics too or like they can't you can't translate that into American music because yeah. of the way and how poetic that culture is so I fell in love with the natural feeling of just playing melodies that like hit me in certain parts of my body and continue to just play like that. And I, w I wasn't writing actual music. I still can't even read music mm. because mathematically I'm just not up to par. Um, but it was just a form of like self-expression. And again, it was like you always knew if I was having like a bad day or like was going through something or, mm. um, you know, if, if I if I I could just always express that through playing piano. Um, but it was never like me learning how to play classical. I'm not trained in that sense. But um i could you know sit and play you a song and you'll know exactly sort of like what the vibe is absolutely well who were some of your influences growing up um i think musically growing up um you know i i had no musical background from my parents or my siblings or really anybody in my family yeah um my influences growing up were you know hip hop heavily um tupac shakur um and all you know from that angle and then from sort of an alternative angle was Radiohead. Mm. Um, and I more so fell in love with like Tom York's ideologies mm -hmm. than uh, anything else. But obviously musically he was a genius and, and still is. And um, Shaw Day was the female voice that really turned me upside down. But I loved, I always loved all types of music growing up. And then finally when I got into producing music, that's when electron. That's at the same time that I really got into electronic music. When was this, and like, what kind of uh, pushed you towards the electronic side of things? Um, well, there was these like ATB was an artist in electronic music where he was able to like really make it emotional, and it wasn't about sort of like the hardness or aggressiveness to the music as sort of you hear today. Yeah, um, which is a dying sort of sound, but I'm glad now it's sort of going back to that. But initially, it was sort of uh, when I started producing after playing piano because of like the technology of being able to play like MIDI through your keys and that would trigger different sounds on the computer, I fell in love with the art of producing electronic music. Um, and then that happened about a year or two into my young teenage years. So, you know, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time I was starting high school Yeah, and getting into the event side of things. Um, so I was throwing parties with my friends for like my school. Yeah. And that sort of grew into like, you know, being a promoter for clubs and bringing my friends. And then that grew to like me throwing bigger parties for my school. And eventually one of the parties that we threw, our DJ couldn't show up a couple of days before. So the guys I was throwing the parties with were like, why don't you just DJ? Cause I was sort of known as like the music, tasteful kid anyways yeah um so i i burned like a hundred cds 
with my friend Ori a couple of days before the first time I DJed, and then I I played on like what is now an ancient piece of equipment, um, and that night was like the best set of my life. Yeah. You know, I was playing for like a, you know forty fifty of my friends, but the feeling of controlling a crowd with stuff that I love and mm-hmm. just showcasing that was so powerful. Was there a performance aspect of it that you liked in terms of um, just being an actual performer and incorporating that, or was it more the influence you kind of had keeping that, keeping the people going? And when, I think when I look back, um, I love the performance aspect. Okay. Um, and then as I got more into it, I loved the idea of bringing my friends together and people together to listen to what I was loving. Mm -hmm. And that's what kept me super in love with it. And then it was about a year or two into that where I started to produce my own music. And then I fell in love with like playing my own edits and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, DJing my own stuff because now it was more so like playing my own stuff, mixing it with other people's stuff and seeing how people reacted. Yeah. And, you know, I put out an album and then... um, the album came after I had made a, a podcast series called Mind of the Genius. Okay. And this is still in high school, yeah? Yeah, still in yeah. high school. Um, so at this point, I'm like throwing my parties, I'm DJing my parties, um, and I'm starting to produce. And what was the uh, inspiration behind the podcast? Well, that was basically like people kept asking me the songs, like what were the songs that I was playing when I was DJing? And at the time, electronic music was still a tiny little bubble, especially yeah. in LA. Oh, yeah. And so I started burning CDs and putting them online so people could download them. And within a year, it just exploded in high school. That's awesome. And that started for me sort of just passing around CDs at school. Yeah. And people really started to love the stuff I was, I was mixing. And again, no one else was sort of playing that kind of music. And that eventually turned into like a theme of a night that I did, um, which was MI6. Uh, and that was when I was 17 or 18 at this point. Yeah. And they gave me the top room because it was a two-level venue, which is now a restaurant called Doheny Room. And on the second floor, they gave me the dance music room, which was like fit only 100 people. Mm -hmm. And the bottom floor was hip-hop. And you sort of saw from like the six months into the thing, the top floor, there was a line for. That's insane. And the downstairs was sort of fizzling out. Um, and again, this was like one of the only nights that was like a, a night of electronic that wasn't like super underground um, it still appealed to like the new age kids yeah. that were listening to music. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we played bigger shows. My name grew from, you know, a school to a city. Um, and then that turned into a flourishing career internationally. Um, and all that was happening at the same time as me producing. I want to take it back because I think like one of the biggest factors in allowing you to just like it seems so seamless with you. But I don't think a lot of people realize that you were that kid growing up that had such an ambition and such a hustler's spirit. Like, as a kid, like, correct me if I'm wrong, you had like 10 to 15 jobs. Like, you were really just getting after it. What, what was the motivation for that? Um, what's interesting because, <clears throat> excuse me, they, well, people always like, when I was a kid, I would always ask people, like, how did you do this? Mm-hmm question is like how did you how did this artist blow up like that right or like how did you get into this yeah and people fail to ask why which is you know like why did you do these things yeah and the reason was i grew up in a in a, in a struggling environment financially okay and my father was basically out of a job you know as fast as i was switching periods during high school and mm. i i had to find a way to make money you know and this was like 15 years old yeah did you feel like you needed to like help support the family oh, was completely, that oh complete i mean i was a uh, basically i'm the only son i had two sisters and a mother and that's like sort of who raised me mm-hmm. yeah and i always felt the need to support myself and you know i never felt good asking my mom for lunch money or you know so for, from an early age i the concept of making my own was instilled Mm. And, you know, me and her had conversations about, like, there's no backup, you know, like, this is, you got to figure it out. Um, and I knew that, but that was sort of where the hustle came from. And, you know, I was like buying shoes from China and selling them on eBay and nice. making money that way. I was, um, you know, I did some things that I'm 
uh, I don't know if I should mention here, but, <laughs> no, um, you know, to, to whatever way I could make money, I was making money. Yeah. yeah. And I fell in love with that at the same time as I fell in love with making music and, and DJing. So, um, you know, like when I was throwing the parties, you have to worry about who, you know, who the promoters are, where's the venue, what, you know, how much does it cost to rent it? What's the cost of operating it? Like all the, who, how much is the overhead? Like all those things at the time were just like natural things I was going through, but yeah. set me up for running a company today. Yeah. Absolutely. And that was, you know, 10 years ago. So, um, the hustle and the ambition was instilled and the, the, the music allowed me to make a living out of it, but I didn't do the music thing because I wanted to make money. I did the music thing really because it allowed me to escape reality. Yeah. And DJing and playing piano and just being around music and being an artist was like my haven or like my safe place mm -hmm. from all the fucked up shit I was growing up with with my family and um, things that I felt in general that, that, you know, didn't sit well with me. Yeah. So the music allowed me to sort of escape from those things. And that mixed with my general understanding of how to turn 50 cents into a dollar um, sort of had this perfect marriage. Absolutely. What about your friends during that time? Um, did you bond with, have, have, a, have a certain crew or a certain bond with people that were kind of going through the same stuff or was it on another side of the spectrum? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, you think that it's obviously difficult being poor in a in any environment but when you're poor growing around poor people like if you're in the hood and you're growing up around everyone's the same as you it's like you're all bonding on this on the same issues but what's actually more difficult i think is growing up poor in a rich environment because you're sort of like trying to figure out like where you sit yeah and so i think that concept allowed me to sort of find my way and the fact that like kids that were making real money or people that were of higher class than me acknowledged and accepted my hustle and respected it even mm -hmm. at that young of an age gave me the confidence to keep going and really there was no other plan you know so when I was like making 500 bucks a night as a DJ or whatever it was like it felt good you know and people respected me for that and they never looked at me as being lower than them yeah. um, I just happened to work really hard and that naturally opened me up to people that were of like the same mentalities as me. So yeah, I mean, my friends were all, my friends were all very receptive and supporting um, of that. I mean, I feel like your, your, your squad, especially like in the high school days was comprised of cats that, you know, had a very similar hustle to them, regardless of, you know, how wealthy the, the families that they came from were or, or, you know, predicaments that they were in. I feel like, that core group of, 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 of kids that you surrounded yourself with were, you know, for the most part, go-getters in, in, in their respective worlds. Absolutely. Yeah, we all, whether it was fashion, music, film, art, whatever, um, we all had that sort of like back against the wall mentality and all had our own issues at home that we had to deal with. And um, But when it came to making money and like trying to prove something to ourselves, yeah, we all had similar mindsets. Yeah, it's interesting. Anytime we talk to people that grew up in a rich neighborhood or rich area like Beverly Hills, um, where you're not rich, where you actually see like the most extreme side of wealth, but you you also see very just core middle class um, or even lower class in some areas. A lot of people don't understand that. And even in Beverly Hills, you have people that move to this city that live in one apartment with one bedroom with like five, six people there. Um, yeah, that was my friend across the street. And that, what I, that also taught me was perception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can be on the same block with somebody and you could be renting and they could be owning, but you're still living in the same block, driving the same car, eating the same food, you know, like you don't necessarily know anyone's situation until it sort of crumbles. Yeah. And in that sense, it taught me like, yo, I can you can really do whatever you want and make it seem like you have it all together mm -hmm. because again, you know, there's different sections to each neighborhood. So like you can be living a block away from someone, but your rent is what their water bill is. Right. And you would never even think of it that way. But the truth is 
that the money that's being spent sometimes is so unnecessary that, you know, you don't have to be spending the amount of money that you think you need to be spending in order to ride with those types of people. So, um, you learn like the bare necessities in life and how to like, how to use those things to get by and still be able to hold your own in a certain capacity when you're growing in a neighborhood like that. No, definitely. I mean, how, how important to you is perception at that time? Just pure perception, how people looked at you despite what you were doing as a DJ or your, you know, um, status financially, how important was that in, in terms of, uh, I think it was more important to my, my mom than, you know, for her son to be successful and like sort of for me to be successful. So I could be, she could be proud of me to her friends. Um, and she still is like the proudest mother in the world. Yeah. But, you know, growing up in a neighborhood where like everybody is driving really nice cars or, um, spending money like the way that they were, it never affected me. It never brought me down. Um, it actually only really inspired me. So I don't have the feeling that like people were ever better than me. I just outworked people. So I knew that if I could outwork people, then, um, I would be there one day myself, but that was never the goal. It was just the perception aspect was more so a driver and being like, I can do this. Mm. When, um, when, when did the goal to start, start becoming reality? Like when, when, when did it start to form for you that, okay, like I want to start taking music seriously, whether it's as a creator or whether it's in the business end, because you dabbled in, in both those spheres at, a, at an early age. Right. So when did, when did that really start to to build for you? And let's let, let's go through the, you know the, you were one of those kids that at a young age, what eighteen, you started interning at a record label, right? Well, even before then, like I was you know cleaning the pulp machine at Robex, you know, <laughs> like I was I was working at the Apple Store to make connections, like I was selling DBAs for a uh, news publication so we could post and I was like making connections with bankers. Like I was so funny. Dude. I had like, you know, I had like, so I was, I was driving through that roller decks. Right? I Let's was, go. I was driving an Izzy van giving out free drinks on Venice and third street promenade to promote the, 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 the drink when it was first coming out. That's, so, that's incredible. You know, that we, I remember being a part of like Izzy's first whole, uh, whole foods, um, buy. Wow. You know, now they're obviously huge, but yeah. at the time, like they were, I was giving out free Izzy. And I was in with the head of the company when it was like three people. And the, 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 the time that I remember um, saying, okay, I'm going to pursue this and not go back yeah. to answer your question was when I was like, fuck you, I'm not working for somebody anymore. And that when, was when early was that? And like, like what did something happen that you reached the fuck you point or were you just like, you know what, fuck this? Well, I guess it was like the point at which. Um, you have nothing to lose, right? So you, you, I sort of, you, you, I come down to like a conclusion in my head where I'm like, okay, if I'm making this much money a month working for somebody, right? Like what's the cap that I can get to in this world? And some people that are okay with having a ceiling. I think for me naturally, um, the idea of having a ceiling was short-lived. So a, ce- a ceiling financially or just a ceiling? A ceiling of- period, you know, like you want to make impact Um, I, I wanted to make, I wanted to be great. And at the time that was by being a musician Yeah. and, and it was never the type of thing where like, I'm going to be a starving artist, right? Like I was never into that either. Um, I don't have like one of those classic stories about like, you know, sleeping in my car and then getting a phone call one day from someone saying like, come on this tour, you're going to, you know, and then the next day you're blowing up. Like it was never that. It was just that I had. Because that, that's a conscious decision. I, and, and I we've knew. Seen the, we've seen the balance between those because some people just like want to stick to their art. Like one out of a thousand will make it that way. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. But then there's others that really make a conscious decision. Like, look, I'm pursuing this path, but I'm going to get my money also. When this path becomes as real as it is, that's when we'll pursue it fully. What, what was that distinction for you? Because I feel like a lot of people like teeter along that. I think that like it came to me rather than me finding it. Mm. So um, it's, we were just having a conversation before when he's like, it's so great. Cause right before I came here, I was, when you mentioned I was getting my pokey, this kid came up to me and he was like, Hey man, you don't know who I am. 
but I'm a huge fan of your label. Like it's in so inspiring to the Jewish community out here. To the Persian Jewish community. To the Persian Jewish community out here. And he was like, yo, and, and he was like, Hi, you know, doesn't it make you feel good that like these Persian Jews in LA are like starting to do this, like that you can like now inspire them to get into music. And back to your point, I'm not trying to inspire anybody to get into music. I actually think it's the hardest thing in the world yeah. and would love to make people realize that like you should be doing other things while you're pursuing the art because it's not easy, right? It's yeah. like what I want to do is inspire people to just do whatever makes them feel good. Yeah. Whether that's painting or or you know cleaning up uh towels off the floor at a basketball court to one day become an agent. What I mean, whatever it is, but um, just doing what makes you feel like your home. Do you think that people like, uh, and I want to like walk through this creative line with you because I feel like a lot of people lie to themselves about how good these things feel, thinking about the end and how great it could be, right? right? So when, when you tell somebody you know, do whatever it takes to make you feel good. What, what does that What does that mean to you? Because, it, like, I feel like, especially with creatives, there's a very, like, it's a tightrope that you walk on of, like, I'm not going to sacrifice anything. I'm going to give my all to my art and craft and this, that, and the other. But this is a music business. Right. A lot of these things are business-based, right? Right. So... It, the, the feel good comes to the point where you're you're killing yourself to become better every day and you're doing every single thing in your capability and a lot of times that doesn't feel good until it does right right well it all de- well, what i mean what makes you feel good is that it's also dependent on like what your definition of success is to you Got right it. so you guys remember when you asked me last time I was on the show like what's your definition of success yeah. and i said it's whatever makes whatever however you feel in the morning yes mm-hmm. right which was absolutely brilliant so I I still, you know, I stand by that because it's like your definition, your definition of success is chosen by you. So some artists or musicians are cool playing guitar in a band or playing guitar in their garage Mm -hmm. and that's okay to them. Right. And that's totally fine. Um, You shouldn't try to be more or bigger or whatever it is than you want to be because you feel like you need to be. Mm. So it's whatever... Um, you, you want to leave in the world and that may be, you know, a drink that you created or it may be a restaurant that you opened up, whatever it may be, but some people are okay with less than what I may be okay with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I always had this driving ambition to to be amazing and then when I realized as an artist that I was never going to be as amazing as I knew I had it in me to be, mm. that was what sparked the transition for me quitting being a DJ and starting a label. Uh, yeah, I want to get into that. But <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But I love that. Um, but going back to kind of that, you know, fuck this moment where the moment where you were going to have no ceiling, you had nothing to lose, and start this endeavor as a DJ, I guess professionally, what were that? What was the, those first moments like? Because w- did you leave high school at that time? Were you I done? did. I left high school. Um, Did you go to college? I applied to schools I didn't get in. Um, and there was a program that allowed kids to study in Israel um, that was fairly inexpensive that I got myself into. And I went there and um, I wasn't really working. And I was that was the first time basically in my life that I couldn't work because um, I was like in school in a different country. Like I'm not going to go work at a coffee shop in Israel or something. <laughs> yeah. you know? So... And that that feeling was paralyzing. Really. Um, so I left that early. Um, you know, I had. I mean, I had, my anxiety was probably the highest it had ever been in my life because I just was was unable to to create. And I was in a room of people learning from someone, in, you know, in the front of a class. That that didn't inspire you, or you know that that was the most complacent I'd ever felt. And I immediately. I mean, I was like, you know, I was just feeling out of my mind, and I flew back home. And how long did you last my, over there? I was there for like, you know, a couple months, maybe yeah. less than six. 
being in the in the classroom environment because a lot of people I think can thrive in that environment of you know they get very inspired learning from a great professor or being amongst a class or other students or even abroad um, and just that whole entire experience but for you you're saying it was um, the fact that you couldn't actually put your hands to work and, and get right well at that time I was like 20 or 21 um, and I and I just felt like. I was wasting my time by not being able to experience as opposed to learn. And I'm yeah. always learning every day, but I'm learning through work mm-hmm. and through my own trials and tribulations, not through a textbook trials and tribulations. Yeah. And it's funny because I was actually watching this, this speaker speak the other day online and he was saying from 20 to 25 is the only time in your life where you can do whatever you want to do fail as many times as you want to fail and still be able to create something that's going to last the rest of your life without the pressures of real life. Mm. So, and it's probably the truest thing in the world to me because, you know, from 20 to 25, I was sleeping. I had like, I'd moved around like 10 times from like my friend's couches or, um, you know, shitty homes in Hollywood or um, my mom's house and her back house or, wherever basically life allowed me to feel inspired. Mm-hmm. And that was because I, I felt no fear because I was young, right? But as you get older, you're naturally instilled with fear of time. Yeah. And from 20 to 25, you can eat fast food every day, right? Mm-hmm. You can go to the club and not have to buy a drink at the bar and sort of just like finagle and, and be there and still be cool, right? Like yeah. you don't have to like take your girlfriend to nice dinners. All you got to worry about is yourself. Yeah, and life isn't really happening. No, and in that in that degree. Mm-hmm. And the second you hit twenty, you know, you know, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight. Yeah. Um. I mean, dude, there's just there's no you. You don't have that anymore, right? There's not people that are older than you rooting for you to win anymore because the twenty eight year old is now competing with the forty five year old with three kids. You're you're just in the same exact bracket. Yeah. And when you're 20 to 25, you're like, you're starting your own thing. You're on fire. You can afford to lose and get back up and brush your shoulder off and just keep going. You don't have a wife, kids. You don't have have real responsibility. And I, you know, even without a wife and kids, you still got rent. Yeah. You know, you got like healthcare, insurances, responsibilities. I mean, you have real life. So the truth is, if (coughs) that's why I felt like how I felt like my, my first couple months of college where I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? I'm gonna, you know what I mean? By the time I'm out, not only do I have loans, but I just learned a bunch of stuff that's not even going to be applicable to what I love anyways. And that feeling was, again, the most anxious feeling I'd ever felt. Mm. So I knew at that moment, like, you know, in school, in high school, I breezed by, you know, because you're in high school, you could sort of figure it out. Sure. Um, and it's funny because when I came back from school and started working again, I had gone back to get my, you know, whatever degree I could get out of Santa Monica College. And it was easy because I was home again, you know. So I was working, I was DJing again, I was back in the city, people were excited. And I applied to school to finish my classes at a UCLA or a bigger school out here. And I applied with the exact same application that I applied to the first time and got denied with, except with a couple more classes I got when I was in Israel. And now another year at SMC had just finished. So I don't have credits, but I basically like changed my grades from C's to P's on my application. Mm-hmm. And what do you mean by that? When you apply to college, they accept you based on your app, not based on your transcript. So what you tell, what you say on the application is what they're seeing before you actually send in your <laughs> transcripts. So I learned that, listen, I could, I could go in this and just make my GPA way higher than it is by taking everything that was under a B and putting P. Because you could put P or no. I love this you could put guy. pass or no pass. That's yeah. what it stands for in applications. Love, this is a hustle in him, though. And so I got in, That's and sick. and rarely does you and I and I got the letter like a year, a couple months later, and I was like, I even forgot that I fucking applied. Yeah. Yeah. Where to? Go? Where to? UCLA. Oh, UCLA. And this dude is like ultimate finesse, though, though. Like this is like, you know, what's crazy. Like I can honestly say this admission thing to UCLA is like one of the lighter things that he's like finessed in this way. <laughs> It's just glorious. Well, it goes back to when we talk about perception, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and luckily, the internet allows you to make whatever perception you want in this world, as we see every day with people who are making God knows how much money off Instagram and YouTube stuff. Absolutely, yeah. So 
Anyways, the point is, I got in, um, and I'm gonna start calling you Davey P. <laughs> I I got in. I ended up going. I got ended up going to UCLA, um, and that was at the exact same time that my career really took off in South America. Uh, there so, was so you're still DJing at the time. I'm still DJing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and SAExperts.com uh, got me through my degree at UCLA. That's lit. Um, I took history and a couple little like. <laughs> Persian chickies that like, yeah, I was like a VIP saying? member on SX. No, 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 it was it was expensive. All my DJ money was basically going to pay that <laughs> and my tuition. Um, That's amazing, dude. Yeah, and I had some friends help me through through college, but when I walked, it was like the laughing stock of yeah. my family, you know, because it was like, what the, what am I doing walking? <laughs> You know, so I mean, for the family, it was actually glorious, but like it was a laughing stock of like the my inner friends. circle. And, yeah, and was it just to get like at that point though? It was, was, stri- it, it was strictly for my mom's peace of mind. Yeah. Just to get to have that that it degree. Was stri- it was strictly for you on that. It was stri- my my degree. Again, I wasn't active in school, but mm-hmm. my degree in having that paper, if that let her sleep better at night, it was was important to me. Yeah. So. um You got to think to like Persian parents in this realm, like that degree is like st- instant stability. Uh, dude, you know what I mean? Yeah, and the truth is, I love my mom, but if I would have listened to her, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have been a quarter of what I am today. So I owe as much to her listening as much as I do not listening. Yeah, you know, because yeah. it would have been her way, I would have been, you know, still in law school or becoming yeah. a doctor. But it's so. beautiful how things work out because uh, again, everything happens for a reason. You know what I'm saying? I feel like, I feel like that time, you know, allowed for different things to take place, and it was also a much mellower time in in your life, like. Granted, the, the the touring in South America started to pick up. The touring started to pick up, but it was like a, a point in which it was necessary for that to happen. Yeah, yeah. well, um, I I said this the other day, but life has a really funny way of connecting the dots for you mm. when you're really looking for the answers. And I was really looking for the answers, you know, in my last couple of years of school. And, um, that ended up actually putting me in a hole of a position with my DJ career, but um, you sort of have to find the light in every situation Mm -hmm. and take as much advantage as you can of that light and hopefully find your way through. So um, my my college years were more so, you know, I never went to a frat party. I don't even know know like what beer pong is or, you know, I never went to things like that. I was just always working and DJing and trying to make my career better. But my classmates whom... Uh, I don't really know that well, but that were there were, you know, studying and doing exams. And I wasn't really stressing over that stuff because yeah. I, I just thought it was pointless. Yeah. Because I, I knew I had a purpose that couldn't have been institutionalized. Got Whereas me. people in school, they have to sort of find their purpose through the institution. And that's, that's you know, it's another ceiling. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a different way of doing it. You know, I think... I mean, I think you have to find, figure out what works for you. And apparently, like during this time, school just wasn't part of the equation. I mean, I, I'm sure that's it's like that for a lot of musicians. I mean, I've seen it across the board. Um, were you set on being a DJ? Yeah, totally. There was no other thing. I'm a DJ. That's it. Yeah, I was. You know, I thought I was going to be the next Tiesto. Like there was nothing that stood in my way. Because that's a big piece of it. So, because if you're in class learning about you know astrology yeah and thinking about I'm imagine this kind of fucking US well, even worse suppose I'm learning about like me, like mediterranean mesopotamian history <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. mesopotamian history yeah. and all you can think of in your mind astrology is like, would have been nice just, actually <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's like yeah stepping away from your production for the two-hour lecture right with the 15 minute break right to Think of like I need a BTS though, and you're watching all these other DJs. I'm sure, right? And hearing that influence you, it's got to it's got to be somewhat torturous during that. Yeah, and it's funny because learning that process is what allows me to speak to my artists the way that I do. Right? It's like when I was making music and still worrying about school and family and life and money, I wasn't making the best shit I can make because I was under pressure. And when you create under pressure, you're never going to make the best shit you can make because you're mm. making it for a somewhat of a skewed reason. And like I was hoping that it'll pop. Yeah. Well, exactly. So, and, um, I got into the DJing thing because I loved playing stuff that I loved playing. And then when it became part of like 
my livelihood as well. Um, that's when things got very, very, very hard for me. It's interesting because, you know, there, and I'm, I just want to compare this when people say like, you know, you, when you're in your toughest times or most desperate, a lot of the really cool creative stuff or great things come from desperation. Right. Is that different than pressure? Yeah, I think that um, I was more in the desperation stage than pressure. Mm. Um, you know, there's good stress and bad stress, right? And there's the same thing with with pressure, right? There's good pressure and bad pressure. And when the pressures are financial, um, it's a, it's diff, it's different than I think the pressure of wanting to make the best record. You know, my pressures were like, how do I get the most money out of this next show so I can afford my car payment? Yeah. You know. How do you um, how do you balance that knowing knowing and especially you because like you have one of the most gifted ears in music in my you. opinion, um, it and to me it just stems from a profound love of music and like I've just been fortunate enough to be a part of your process for such a long time, um, and be in awe of that, but at the same time it's like the foreshadowing is right up front for you because I feel like you see things way far ahead of them coming to fruition. Because like, I remember we used to have talks about this, like knowing that the sound that was getting very much so popularized in the clubs and the DJs coming out, it was so far away from what you were doing and what you were about and also what brought enjoyment to you, right. which led to the you waking up in the morning and not being happy. Right. right? Because when you were first creating, you'd wake up, you Let's go. You had that fire in you. You're ready to go. Right. But knowing that the days were coming when you're waking up and you're like, holy shit, like I'm making X amount of money. This industry is giving a lot of money to this genre, but I'm I, this, that's not me. Right. There was a the moment was David Guetta and Akon had that song. Sexy, 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 uh, sexy bitch. Okay. And that was the first song that sort of opened the floodgates for kids in America to embrace dance music the way that they did. And that's, that was the beginning of the Avicis and the Afrojacks. And, um, they came in and basically commercialized the sound that had been underground for so long. And when they did that, it basically forced all the underground guys to make a decision. And at the time, I was sort of, you know, quote unquote, underground guy. You either stay underground and take a huge pay cut. Or you adapt as an artist mm -hmm. to the current sound and you try to play ball with guys like that. And that basically lasted for about a year and a half to two years when I kept going back and forth. When I was like, okay, do I make this kind of music? But if I make this kind of music that I love, I'm not going to make money on my shows. <coughs> and Can you take us through that, like your, your well, mind? Pr yeah, products of that were me basically being told by promoters what to play live at shows. And if I didn't, then they'd kick me off. Mm. Or I, 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 you know, I got pulled off stage because I wasn't playing commercial enough music. Um, you know, in places like Brazil or Argentina. And that became more of a trend. And as that, not me getting kicked off, but me having to adapt to play what was... You know, instead of educating the crowd, I was having to just assimilate and play what was hot. And I didn't get into it for that reason. I, I, I got into it because I loved playing what I loved playing and people enjoyed that. There's this like ceiling coming over you. The box is just... It was a cloud, close. right? It was like, it was a cloud of what you said. Like you got to make, you know, these are my costs now, right? Like, you know, we talked about before, like you started having car, like I had rent, I had, you know, car insurance, all these things. And I basically had no choice but to play rooms and places and play music that I didn't want to play to make money. And when I started playing to make money mm -hmm. as opposed to playing because I loved playing and the money just came was when I went through, you know, probably the darkest time in my life. The drinking turned on a lot more. That's when you accepted it. Yeah. Um, I, didn't have a, I didn't have a choice but to accept it. Yeah. There was no like steady pivot there. Yeah. It was like, it, it was that song really, it, it, you know, from that moment it was like, that was the, that, that led everything else. And, um, I went through a huge identity crisis, you know, as an artist trying to figure out what to do. Like, do I do a song with this guy? Do a song with that guy? Like I know where to turn. So I just stopped DJing and said, fuck it. My show is so slowing down anyways. Right. Like I'm, so I'm like, I'm just, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, 
and then sort of the rest is history. But that was with that with that kind of um, you know, it's such a part like music's going to evolve, and naturally everything. Right. If, if it didn't, we'd still be listening to blues, jazz, you know, into classic rock. Like you wouldn't see any evolution actually happen. I feel every artist is kind of put into that. You have to adapt or evolve kind of with the times. You can't just stay in your in your comfort zone sure. either. How do you balance that to what's going on to where you were as a DJ doing what you want to do and not going the commercial route, but understanding that the time is changing. The audience wants something different, not necessarily doing this for money, but doing this to be progressive. Well, when I was, when I was 16 or 17, um, while I was DJing at that place on my six, I told you about earlier, there was a guy who saw me DJing dance music and, had the vision to bring me into his company. Um, it was a record label called Thrive Records. And I was head of dance A&R at 16 years old at that label. And my job was to bring in, you know, the next batch of kids that were going to be hot and sign them. Guys like Avicii, Nervo. I brought them in for their first meetings in LA. So I learned at that point what the business was, but I wasn't in the, in like the trenches of, I was sort of just on like, let's sign and put out as opposed to like, learning about the waves, which you're referring to. Yeah. Um, and that sort of prepped me a little bit for when I was my own artist, but I didn't, but I was never a part of a changing culture as an artist myself at that time. Mm. So when I was a part of it, I basically, I got ran through, right? Like I got stomped and ran over. I think that artists in general, yeah, I mean, the sounds are always going to change, right? Like, if you come in right now, like, if you're coming in as a rock artist right now, there's never been a more difficult time to permeate because yeah. just no ears want to hear that. Yeah, very difficult. With the youth, especially. Yeah. Guitar music is really hard to do, right? Unless you're mixing it with electronic beats or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, you're going to have waves in every scene, but I, I do think that there is a limited amount of artists um, that have that vision and are able to view their artistry as a separate thing than who they are as a person. Meaning, they always said that Madonna was Madonna because she didn't view herself as Madonna, mm -hmm. right? And you view your, your artistry as a separate sort of, I don't want to say business, but as, a, entity. as an entity. Um, so I, I found that the artists that I work with that operate from that angle are able to make the best decisions for their, for their careers because it's not as, I don't want to say personal, but they're able to separate the two. For me, I was never able to separate the two because I, my artist was my name, right? Like I was David Dan, the DJ. Yeah. And my album cover was me on it. Like everything was me. So I felt like the more that I kept, <coughs> the more that I kept trying to compromise my sound, I was actually like, I was selling my soul, you know, to, the, to like trying to please others outside of myself. And that's why when you're an artist and you have like a project per se, right? Where like Sade is a band, you know? Or like Radiohead, like Tom's the writer, but there's a band of instrumentalists. Like there's like a team of people now. Yeah. And even at that level, it becomes difficult, right? Because there's different waves like what you mentioned, mm -hmm. but you're still able to view your artistry separate from yourself as a human being, right? Like I am not what I eat as a musician, right? Like my food... And my records were synonymous when I was an artist because yeah. it was all the same thing, but it can't be like that. It just, it just, you know, for for better or for worse, it just can't be like that as an artist, or else you will get, you know, for the most part, forgotten per se um, when the next wave comes. That's when the identity crisis kind of started happening because you just you couldn't separate or say like, look, this is the music I make, what I want to make from the heart, but I. I know if I want to be successful right now in these times, I've got to jump into this more commercialized sound that just wasn't you and you couldn't just separate those yeah, two I felt, things. I just, yeah, I felt phony, you know? Like I was going to play in front of huge crowds and playing stuff I didn't want to play Yeah, and it just felt like shit. How come you didn't want to play it? It, it, it wasn't my Not, taste. Yeah, just, it, just, it didn't was it connect. the sounds or the styles? It just yeah, didn't the, connect to you. Yeah, the sound became really aggressive in dance music a couple of years ago. Um you know, electro per se. That's what mm -hmm. they, they said. Um, and it was just like a, it felt like metal, you know? And I think coming from, you know, me, me uh, shout out to Nushi interjecting here, but 
knowing like <laughs> shout out to Nushi giving himself a shout out. <laughs> I didn't even realize that. <laughs> no, but like he, you're the type of person that's very emotionally attached to living, right? And creating in and of itself. And I feel like that you have a, such a strong uh, connection with your own empathetic realm. Right. And the music, like you could tell through his, his, his uh, influences and you can also tell through the music that he was making, there was a beauty in the escape that music had provided him. Right. So like I really, I started to look at it like, cause I was around David for the, 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 the two years that like it really went to, towards that dark period. And like, it was like the conflicted period. Right. But coming from somebody that, that literally like painted landscapes where like you can almost see a unicorn in the background. Right. To taking them and asking them to be confined in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, underground rave in Berlin where there's just like, it's like Berkheim, if you will, right? Like you could just tell that the, the soul, the, the, the kindred spirit's not going to be happy. Yeah, it was, you know it, was, yeah it, was, it was deep inside it. it, didn't, like it he, didn't he was right. very, very, very influenced by melody and, and by song and by, and, 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 and by the beauty in music, whereas the, the way that this genre was going was just bashing you over the head. Well, the, with, well to, that, to that notion... It really isn't so much connected to music. Um, and I'm learning a lot about myself still because I'm still growing. But like I went, you know, the other day um, car shopping, right? Or like even when I go shopping for anything, I can afford way better things than I could have ever dreamt of affording when I was, you know, younger and being this age right now. I still wear the same shit that I wore when I had no money. And I still can't drive a nice car because I just don't feel right, right? So, like, this T-shirt is some shit that I had when I was, you know, 24, struggling. You know, so it's like, the the truth is, like, I just was never into trying to be something that I'm not. Mm. And that goes beyond just being a DJ. Um, And I've always been that kind of person where, like, I wear my heart on my sleeve with everything. And I think that's where the music thing connects back to as opposed to that connecting the music thing where like absolutely, I could just never fake it. You know, I, I can't fake anything to a fault. Um, but that's, that's sort of where the identity crisis really hit its, hit its, its toll. Take us through the, 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 the transition to Mind of a Genius. Like what was that period from when you decided to hang up the decks, if you will, Shout out to the decks hanging up. Can you imagine that? Sure. <laughs> Fucking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but take us through that. Um, that period. That transitional period and then, you know, the, the start. Well, oddly enough, um, my whole career as an artist, I, it was always like Mind of the Genius Presents before yeah. my even name was, was there, right? All my events had that branding, everything for years. And when I stopped DJing... Um, and I went back to just sort of producing, per se, and still trying to figure it out. Um, I got introduced to this kid via my agent at the time, um, some shit agent who was stealing from me. And the week I fired him, um, a couple of days before I made the call, he said, hey, you should go meet this kid I just picked up. He's a really good producer, but um, he needs some help marketing, and you're really good at marketing. And I was like, word, so... Um, I went to the studio and met this kid. The beats were amazing, but like he wasn't making shit that was like going to pop at that moment. And But I could tell he was very talented. Um, I always had a thing for finding talent regardless of my own shit. So I left and make, I didn't make anything of it. Um, my agent comes into town. He's like, hey, we should get uh, lunch with me, you and Steven. This is like two days later. And so I'm like, okay, cool. So we get in the car. We go to lunch. We had breakfast actually here on 3rd. Um, we're driving back to drop me off and the kid, Steven is like, yo, I, had, I made this demo the other night. You want to hear it? I'm like, what? Let me hear it. Plays me this like 30 second clip in the car of like some shit he made. And I was like, damn, this is pretty, you're singing on this. And he's like, yeah, I just started like, you know, a couple days ago. And I was like, cool, this is pretty good, man. And he's like, yeah, you, like we should work on it together. I'm like, fuck yeah. So I go to his house a week later. I fired the dude, uh, who was my agent and, um, we write a song 
together in like 30 minutes. And he he had written like he had written the lyrics um, the night before, but we came in and, and made basically the full song within 30 minutes. And that was the first time we'd worked with each other. And the lyrics to the song were Baby, I'm faded. All I want to do is drive downtown. Baby, I'm faded. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Word, this song is fucking tight. It's fucking wild. And that was the first one y'all worked on. It was the first song we ever worked on. That's insane. And we made the That's song. Insane. We made the song in his room that was the size of like, you know, a kitchen, a small kitchen. His bed was right there in the corner. His computer was foot so you know feet away from his bed. And um, I knew the song was a hit. You know, if I knew anything in my life, I knew when songs were smashes before they came out. That's why I started doing A&R so early. And originally, the song was going to be a David Dan featuring. Steven record and um, I sort of as months went by and we continued to make more music and I fell more and more out of love with the idea of myself being becoming a performer um, I saw this as an opportunity to help somebody else um, and be able to or, or try to at least use all my knowledge of an artist with someone else and just see how it felt when were you still kind of in this? I dark was still, period? I was still, yeah, I was still, I was still making music, mm-hmm. but we basically decided at that like a couple weeks later um, to get a studio together. And when we got that studio together, I had my own room, he had his own room, and um, we made an EP together. And I was heavily involved with the production and creation of that EP. Um, and that was at the same time that I was fizzling out as an artist. And creating a team around Zoo, and basically, basically, we 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 spent a year to a year and a half just creating, um, and the money I had saved up to the last penny was invested in that studio, um, and I didn't give a fuck because at that point I'm like. Like, this is it, right? Like, I don't, like, I'm not, not going to do music. I know I have something really talented on my hands. Um, I'm going to go for it, you know? Mm-hmm. And he, you know, was, was trusting enough in me. Um, and I always say, you know, when I was an artist, I was playing chess, you know? It was like, I had to think about my move. It was calculated. Maybe it was right. Maybe it was wrong. And I kid you not, man, like the second... I started working with another artist. I was like the best checkers player to ever play checkers. That's so interesting. <laughs> because wow. yeah, what do you think? it was like the last 10 years of my life had brought me to this place of guiding a project of my own. And it was like the piano, the DJing, the marketing of myself, the a and for this label, the... The, the 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 heartbreaks the heartaches the bad management the bad age like all the things that like not worrying about social media and worrying about the product only like basically everything that I live by I can now use mm. on someone else to give them that knowledge and lead them and um, obviously with the help of many others involved um, but a team that I put together of um we launched a very successful product and um at that moment it was like it, it was it was it was obviously such a relief um because a lot of guys come and they do it one time and they're out and like you know you're sort of you're lucky at that point right but yeah um i knew i was there to stay you know i, I knew that when i was working with someone else on something that wasn't my own Right when I was able to view this as a different thing than David Dan, um, that there was nobody who was going to compete with me. There was just nobody who had studied harder than me. There was nobody that had been in it as much as I was. Um, you know, like I, st- I, I was obsessed. Right, um, and it wasn't a game. Like it's funny because you look at the NBA and you look at guys like Nick Young or you look at guys like Kobe Bryant. Right. The fundamental difference is not 
that they're playing different games. They're both playing with a ball and shooting into a fucking hoop, right? But Kobe takes the game it's as not serious. T- talent isn't the difference there. No, I, I, Kobe Kobe takes the game as serious as anybody who's ever taken the game, right? Yep. I and and because for him, um, it is the same thing that music like is for me, mm. which is. I'm not comparing myself to Kobe. What I'm saying is like the drive for excellence is just unprecedented. Um, and I didn't, and I, and I always had the drive. I just didn't know where to apply it <coughs> other than myself. Cause that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. But the second I was able to apply it on a direct thing that wasn't me, um, it was seamless. How know? did, how did the team get put together? Because I know that, like, what, what what people aren't getting here is that when, when the moment that he decided that to go all in and and they got the studio spaces, <laughs> he was getting contractors left, right, and center to like start creating this this spot so that it could become what it is what, today. What it is today. The like, there was no doubt in his mind. Like he was like, you know what? Fuck it. Like this isn't just going to be a studio or record out. This is going to be the birthplace of. Mind of Genius Records, and he, he he set himself up to do whatever he could to make the label an entity even when it wasn't again perception how, how, right yeah so i stopped recording at this point and as an artist or? yeah i'm purely just zoo you know mode and the music was so fucking good that it just attracted people to want to come work with us and you know there was tons of early interns and um people that just wanted to be at the studio and all those people led to the right people and that's sort of when you realize like jay-z always has this line where he's like the shit's good enough i'm gonna hear it right like you don't gotta worry about submitting a demo because if it's good enough it's gonna get to me somehow yeah and the truth is like it, it is i mean it's the truth right like you make a good enough product and you're in a city where there's this many people, yeah. it's going to get to the right person. Yeah. If the shit doesn't get to the right person, it's simply because it's not good enough. Absolutely. And there's there's no getting around that concept, right? Agreed. Like in anything that you do, whether it's food, hospitality, what any idea, if the thing is really sought out and sorry, thought out and developed enough, it's going to get in the right hands. And for me at the at that time, the right hands were who's now my co-manager with Zoo is Jake Udell who'd been managing a group called Cruella. Yep. And it wasn't until Jay came in where he was like, okay, product's amazing, let's let's finish it. But this is how we're going to roll this thing out. And, um, you know, the amount of stuff that I learned from that guy was, was you know, within a year was, was, was monumental. Because um, he'd already been in the game for a couple of years and had success and was an entrepreneur and um, really taught me the importance of capital to start something as opposed to just starting something and like letting it go out in the air and making people care as opposed to just putting something out. Well, elaborate on that in terms of capital. Um, well, the ch- I mean, product with no marketing is a dead product, right? Like you could be making the most revolutionary thing in the world, but unless you have a way to get it to the people, like it's, it's not going to move. So, um, you know, the question I always ask people, the first thing is like, well, if I if I find a product that's really good, I'm like, how are you marketing it? It doesn't have to be traditional, but like, what's the plan? And he really taught me how to plan and um, helped Zoo and I both understand the importance of financial investment was, you know? So Zoo, Zoo had some money left over and, um, you know, we, we that's what helped launch this project, you know? Like, I remember... When we wired our radio guy in Australia a couple thousand bucks, we thought it was like the end of our lives, <laughs> not knowing that that you know would turn into half a million dollars in two and a half months of sales. Yeah. So um, because the song was so good, but at the time we didn't give a fuck about what was going to happen. We just wanted to put the music out, and we knew the music was right. But it wasn't until Jay came in he was like, "Wait, hold on a second, right? Like, let's plan this." Um, and then, you know, from there I learned about how much it takes, you know, my, my biggest theory now is preparation before, before anything, because, you know, if you have, if you have a really good product, it's worth it to spend the time preparing a plan than putting it out and just hoping people are going to come to it because they're not, because there's just too much noise. Now for the indie artist who's got nothing, but maybe he has that really good product, yep. but no money. Mm-hmm. 
you know, what do you, what do you tell that kid who's listening right now? Who's like, who, I mean, yeah, you could say, look, someone's eventually going to, going to hear it if it's good enough. Right. But in the interim, uh, it's still very rare that the right person might hear it. Is, is capital no. the, the only thing? No. Um, well, obviously that's why you go to a label, right? Sure. If you're an indie artist like that, yeah, but absolutely. Um, if I'm an indie artist and I know I have amazing music, I'm going to a lawyer first thing. I'm going to find my way to a music lawyer because music lawyers are in with everybody. So, and a music lawyer will take your call for free because they want clients. You know, there's plenty of ways to do it, right? I'd walk my CD into every office. I'd email everybody that I could. I'd get connected to people in every which way possible. And the truth is, if your stuff's good enough, then someone's going to want to be the one to show you to somebody, right? It's the classic Jazz Prince Drake story to Lil Wayne. Absolutely, yeah. So, um... If you're making stuff that's good enough, you should have no problem getting to the right person. Um, but being knowledgeable and educated on the business is just as important as how good you're making your product. So I, I mean, I encourage everybody to, not every, I don't encourage everybody to do anything, but I, I um, try to encourage any artist to be knowledgeable of what the business is too, outside of just what making the product sounds like. In terms of the different players or just how the game works, the different royalties or, you know, because some could argue that could get in the way. Not of Not so much the technicalities because mm-hmm. um, that stuff you can go through with like a family lawyer, like a lawyer that you meet and he'll teach you that stuff in like a couple, you know, a couple weeks or whatever it is. Sure. But um, more so studying the progression of artists that you aspire to be like career. So when I said I, st- by the time I started with you, I'd studied so much. When I say I'd studied so much, I meant that I had read every single fucking artist Wikipedia in the world that I wanted to be associated with, right? I knew every single person's manager's name. I knew exactly how every single artist broke. I knew who was doing whose press. This is all public information, right? Like I knew what blogs broke what song. I knew why Zane Lowe was Zane Lowe, why P. Tong was P. Tong in the dance world. Like I just studied interviews of artists and read, you know, music business books or read as many because I because I was so hungry and learning the business was so inspiring to me at that point because I was starting to launch a project starting to launch a project excuse me so um I just you know it's like if you want to know like we were talking about earlier like I went to the Bonnie Vare concert last night and he played and he had a Hollywood Bowl sold out without a single major radio hit I was like how did this happen I typed in Bonnie Vare Wikipedia I looked it up and I found out like so what do you do? You apply that to what the fuck you're doing, you know? So um, that, that, and that, that's just like, again, if you really want it, you'll figure it out, you know? Yeah. That's why I don't believe in the starving artist theory, especially in 2016. Absolutely. Like you got to know your shit and, and you have the opportunity to know your shit because it's all out there. So after the success of Zoo happens, how do you, now, now you're at a point where you have what, five artists under your label? Yeah. Naturally, it's important to break one to for it to become real. Right. Right. What are, who are the artists that you guys are working with now and what are the pressures that, that you're dealing with in, actually not pressures, but what's the process in developing these artists and also getting them ready for the road ahead, but navigating through the world and, 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 and the industry window that you want to navigate through because you guys are, aren't navigating through where the majors are sure you are but to a de- you're much more nimble well i i love comparing what we do to sushi um i, I love sushi right like i've but i never loved sushi growing up okay and i feel like we're serving nigiri right meaning like we're serving just the rice with just a piece of fish on top okay but to get people to the nigiri into that form of sushi, you got to start by dressing that shit in sauce, in you know flavors, in presentation that the person can enjoy it in before they get all the way there. Meaning, like I got into sushi from the roll aspect, right? Yeah, soy sauce, you know, sriracha, yeah. <laughs> all these fucking things, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was like, "Whoa, this is amazing!" When I was younger. And then, like, as you get deeper and deeper into it, like, and you get to the rawest form of it, which is just the, the quality of the fish and the rice, you never go back. Yeah. So, meaning, the development, like, 
our music is that right it's like the tr- it's the truth of music and the development process for me is basically bringing out that truth from the artist while also presenting it as a role so if there's a way that i can say okay look galant we want to get we want people to to love you because of what you're writing about right but we can't get them to love you for what you're writing about until we give them something that's going to introduce you to them in a way where they're going to understand what like what you even begin to stand for. Mm. So it's like a river into an ocean, mm-hmm. right? So if the artist is a truth and a message, getting the fan and listener to that message is the marketing development process. The development process of the actual music is, is simply just nurturing what they want to do. Okay. So... Um, giving them a sound and saying, go down this way. Are you going that, you know, having that conversation with the artist um, and just identifying basically which direction to take them down and hoping that that direction is going to be successful. So with every artist, it's a different lane, right? It's a different approach. Like we said, like Bon Iver is an artist without a radio hit, but is that big, you know, but it took him eight or nine years to get there. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you have an artist that's at the Hollywood Bowl, Kygo within two years of being out. Yeah. Right. So every artist is a different process. And every genre is very different. Electronic music tends to feed people that are on YouTube and internet because those fans are those types of listeners and viewers. Yeah. You know, rock music tends to attract more live and now way more or less types of groups of people in America. But at the time was like a way more like tour driven yeah. thing. Whereas electronic music, you're not making, you're not breaking a record off touring as an electronic act. So every genre, you know, for an R&B act, it's like the, the, environment in which you listen to that music is very important right like you with your girl you're going through a breakup or like you're whatever they're talking about you have to identify with the listener Mm -hmm. so however and those are the marketing development conversations we have every day but the music aspect we don't even start talking about the marketing until the music's done and basically with the music what we try to do is keep that as purified as possible so we can make the best product or they can make the best product per se from a place in their mind of just abundance of just wanting to make the best record possible, which again is why our deals with artists are very special in a sense that like they're not gigantic advances, but they're enough to keep you sane and happy and eating well. So you can just record because you want to record. Yeah. And we give you the studio, we give you the tools, we get, like, we we try to we try to make you feel at home, which is why our office is a home turned into a studio, because I feel like you can only if you 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 make the best possible music. By being in a, an environment in which you're comfortable in. Mm. And that doesn't mean you have to be in a $2,000 a day recording studio with a huge board in front and yeah. all these gadgets and things. Because all those things are just distractions. Absolutely. All our studios are bare. We got a mic. We got an amp. We got a keyboard. Like, And if you want instrumentalists, like, you know, let's do it. But we're not like, you know, none of those rooms are worth more than, a, you know, $5,000 in equipment. Whereas you walk into a studio on Sunset Boulevard a pair of speakers is worth more than one of my whole entire rooms. Yeah. So we just, we, we, I keep it like that on purpose because if you can't record out of there, then there's something that we just don't all the All the knobs aren't going to help you. You can have all the best plugins and reverbs in the world, right? Or like the best v- instruments in the world. But if you don't know how the fuck to use them, then you're just wasting your time learning about a bunch of shit that's not going to help you anyways. Yeah. So we keep it at a minimum so people just take what they need. And that theory also is applied to every facet of my business. Well, it's kind of like going back to what you said earlier about relieving those pressures or it's so hard when you were trying to make music in college uh, and trying to, to do that when you had the pressure of money, when you had all these obstacles in the way that were preventing you from being your most free, but you don't need to relieve them like in terms of, Hey, here's a million dollar advance. Now, you know, here you go. It's like, no, just take those outside things off and to alleviate for the artist. Uh, yeah, so you know, it's, it's funny because it's actually made my business so much less competitive because it's very easy for us to identify right away if the artist makes sense or not. Because if they don't make sense, then there's no point of us even having a conversation. I'm not going to go into a bidding war over an artist. Yeah. yeah. Because it's like... I feel as if it's a privilege and an honor to work with our team because we put so much heart and soul into things as much as it is for us to work with you. And if you don't feel that same way, then like it's all good, but it, we're just not made to work with each other. So if the vision's aligning, then um, 
things explode, right? But it's in situations where like you have different expectations, um, where things don't make sense. How do you vet that? You feel you feel you. It takes one to know one, right? So you you um. You know right away. You know it's like you see someone. You know, I we used to have this joke at the studio. Like every time an artist would walk in, I'd like know exactly within two seconds of how they felt like, because just through their eyes. And it's like you. I sit down with someone, um, and within five seconds can sort of get like a feeling, you know. And if it's whether it's an employee or whether it's an artist or um, anyone that I'm looking to do business with, like you, you get. It. I had a kid drive from Massachusetts to come work for me yesterday. You know, like because he wants to be there so bad. And the kids like comes from a good family, went to a good college, like, but you know, people are attracted to things that inspire them. So mm -hmm. from an artist standpoint, if they're looking for a lot of money, I'm not saying I'm not, I, I can't afford it, but like if the deal makes sense, it makes sense. But if you're looking for more money and that's, what's going to break you or make you on my deal, then I'm probably not the right partner for you. I have a question on that. It's more in, in terms of like on the business end, mm -hmm. As you understand, it's, sometimes it doesn't just come down to the artist. And I'll, this may, might even touch on uh, what you said about being educated on the business side. As you know, being with a lawyer or a manager, the first thing a lot look for is that advance money. How do you break through those barriers to the artist that, and tell them, hey, you know, if you're in a bidding war with somebody, you don't want to be in a bidding war, but how do you almost not do that to get to that raw piece of the artist to see who they are? We're, we're, we're usually in way earlier mm -hmm. because we're way smaller. So I've never had a situation where I've tried to sign an artist that we couldn't sign mm -hmm. um, because we're just too early and we're so vital to the development process to where it's like you just can't do it without us if you want to get to the place that we both want to get to. And that's why it's always been like, you know, for the most part, a very symbiotic relationship because we all are the same types of people, you know, like we all um, share similar values in life and morals. And that's drawn certain artists to the company because again, we're all the same type of person. Um, and that's really what separates like, I guess any other label head from another label head, um, is the communication like you know when I was for example doing a deal for Zoo it's like the label heads that we met were so important to us because of what their visions meant for the artist or you know what they th what they saw coming for the artist mm -hmm. so if I I may I may say something all the time that may not be what you want to hear but maybe I'm just not the right guy for you you know maybe there's someone else who sees your vision in a different light than I do like I'm sure plenty of people would have taken Zoo and just made him a DJ and had him perform with his face and you know, put faded out and have made tons of money playing in Vegas, but we chose not to do that. Like we went down a different path because we saw the same vision. So th those are conversations that um, I couldn't have myself as an artist because I didn't have that solidified of a vision. So we like to sit down and talk about, okay, well, what are you trying? Like, what's the message that you're telling, you know, the audience? And then you build the brand around what that, that message is. It's it's awesome to hear you say that, you know, um, in, in an industry that is dominated by data to discover yep. an artist. Yep. An industry that's dominated by seeing where the trends are going and trying to get your CFO and the COO to throw down some big dollars behind somebody. Right. And all these layers that you have to prove in order to sign someone. Right. Even if you come in early. Right. So for you to, to not abide by those standards and, and, and actually get in early and get in about the message, about about the art, about the song, about the artist himself. Right. How do you take that but also make a really awesome investment into that big picture because as an indie label, even though you, you do have the finances and the, and the support to make things sure. happen, I still, w would you say the risk is still, t um, you can't spend $40 million on 40 different acts right. like a major can, being an indie. Right. So how do you balance that going in early? It's really, it's, first of all, it's very difficult. Um, 
second of all, the conversation is just different with the artist, right? So the conversation isn't, hey, hey, whoever, here's a budget of $100,000, go shoot a bunch of music videos and deliver it back to us. Or hey, here's your recording fund, go record the music and bring it back to us. Don't, I don't, I don't, like the word deliver and deliverables, um, you know, we don't really use. So, you know, we're in it to the point where like, you know, all of us do everything at the company. And, you know, Azad's an A&R who's also involved in sourcing music videos. Um, so we're, we're just that deep into all of our projects. Mm-hmm. And the, actually the more difficult thing is just balancing the time and not spreading ourselves too thin because that's the most difficult thing for me now as the company grows is um, I try to still stay as close as I can to the music and making the music because that's what I'm best at. But when I have to start you know, worrying about the bigger things that come with running a company is when I'm the most stressed out because I'm like, this isn't really why I'm doing this. I understand the responsibility that I have to, I have to maintain. Yeah. But the further I get away from the music, um, I may not feel it within those six months but in two years, when the record comes out finally, or something like that, then I'm going to feel it, you know. So I try to stay as close as I can to the the process of development, um, while still maintaining the financial aspect of making sure people can, you know, stay alive and you know be employed. So it's it's really really difficult. But the relationship with the artist remains the same, which mm-hmm. is um, a nurture, uh, guidance, um, and a phone that will always get answered. Mm. which is very rare rare. in many cases. How do you feel as not being an artist as yourself right now? Um, I feel stressed out. (laughs) We have, we have an album coming early next year from day. Um, no, but how do you, you as a personal, yeah, as a personal thing, like it's funny. It's the first thing I say, it's so synonymous, you know, with like the work and who I, no, I feel you. but, Um, but, But looking back on kind of, I mean, we we still have a ways to go here, but I'm just curious to, uh, you know, as this label is developing and you, you've had during this moment in time, you st- you getting out of that dark period right. with so many dope things popping off. Right. How do you personally feel or, you know, internally about Where you I am. as an artist? Yeah. Um, I feel like I, I feel like, I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface of of what I'm like supposed to do. Like, do you feel like DJing? No. Okay. So yeah. Oh no. Oh oh, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. I have totally, which is weird, you know, because it wasn't that long ago that I was so obsessed with wanting to do it. But you don't really um, until you reach like your real calling, you don't realize what if it should feel like it's like being in a bad relationship and then being in a horrible relationship, the bad relationship could seem okay because you've been in a horrible relationship, but it's not until you've been in a fucking amazing relationship to know what a fucking amazing relationship feels like. Right. Yeah. So it's like, if you've been eating McDonald's your whole life, you have no idea what a good steak tastes like if yeah. you never had it. So, um, for me, like I didn't, I, I was happy DJing. I loved it. Right. But, and I thought that that was my world. But it wasn't until I was able to impact people at the level that I am now with the label that I'm starting to feel like, wow, you know, this is like, this is really, this is not even on a musical level, but it's more on like a life level um, affecting the community and the way they think and um, about what they want to do. And anytime you can affect people's minds, then in, in that way, it's, it's gratifying. Where do you see your potential going? Because, it, you, you know, you spoke about not feeling like you internally have scratched your own surface. Where do you see that? Like, or, or what's, what's, I don't want to say void because of the connotation, but what, what, what are you yearning for and more of as you continue to progress down this pathway? I, I guess the, 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 the real question is, like, what's the most gratifying part of the process and what ends up, what I think was going to end up being the most gratifying part? Um, it changes, you know, um, it's definitely not financial success. Um, I don't think that that has a direct correlation. I, it's funny, I had Yom Kippur the other day and my rabbi was saying that after $75,000 a year, it's all the same. 
right? Like you're all, your happiness level can't exceed any more than when you're making that much money because like your brain is tuned a certain way. It's like your basic needs are, yeah, well, man, once all like your basic needs are taken care of. For me, it's like if I can go to Chipotle and, and not have to worry about avocado in my bowl, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably so the, real though. The, the guac is a dollar twenty nine extra. The is that funny, okay? yeah. I used, but so, I used to trip. It's yeah. probably so real, yeah. I used to trip, dude. I used to put fucking coke in my water, my water yeah. cups all day because yeah. I didn't want to pay that extra dollar for a drink. Yeah, of course. So like now that I don't have to do that, it's funny when I got my first check, I texted my mom. I said, "Mom, now I don't have to worry about guacamole at Chipotle. I, 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 I saved it." <laughs> it's it's the truth though, right? Because like when you don't got to worry about those little, like you don't, I don't have to worry about putting gas in my car. Yeah. I used to worry about filling up my fucking tank because I'm like, can I drive that far? I have to fill it up. It's 40 bucks. Like, oh my God, where's the cheapest gas? And I still go to the cheapest gas station if I can. Yeah. But like, because those things I haven't changed, you know? But um, the most gratifying thing for me is being able to look a kid in that face and help him find his truth mm. and also affect the kid who's going through some shit in their own house or own life. The through you, music that we're putting there. out, yeah, and I and I still have yet to like. I mean, I still got. I had a kid fly from Berlin the other day, uh, and drove all the way up and down. Sorry, biked up and down Robertson looking for the studio office just to come Shut drop me the off a demo. Fuck up. Took a flight from Berlin with his mom. His mom was crying outside the studio of happiness, so we took his demo. No, and then way. we gave him an opportunity to remix a song from one of our artists, and he was like the most thankful kid in the world. That's awesome. There's moments like that that I'm like, wow, you That's know, this incredible. is really it's amazing, Jesus. but. Um, I guess the 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 end goal for me is to um, say that we put out the best music we possibly could have found in the world, you know? Um, What's the saying that you guys have for your label? Hearing is believing. Mm. And that was because, you know, obviously the, the, the original one is seeing is believing. Mm-hmm. And hearing was always the weird thing for me because, not a weird thing, but it was always um, more powerful in a sense. Like you always ask, like I always ask myself, like, would you rather be blind or deaf when you were growing up? It was always blind right because the feeling i get from hearing is like i i and i and i think it's like a kid who's on ecstasy i've never taken drugs like that but like i get so tranced out and like music takes my brain to like this weird place where like nothing else can um and i think that effect on the fan is what i'm so interested in because as an actor a fan can fall in love with your persona, but you're not being who you are in that film. You're acting as somebody else. So I can fall in love with Johnny Depp's role in Blow, but Johnny, that's not Johnny. Mm-hmm. So when I see him, like, yeah, I'm like starstruck, obviously, but I'm not like, oh my God, that's the same guy that I just saw in the James movie. Chung. Right, right? <laughs> but as a musician, you have the opportunity to be yourself and create an impact like that. I mean, what the fuck else can you ask for in this world? You know, and if you have a partner as a as a label, a manager, whoever, who sees the same vision with you and can help you execute that vision, I mean, you can't really ask for more. You Absolutely. Know? So I think if I can continue doing that, I'll be I'll be on How my way to happiness. How important is your team for allowing you to be able to do that? The most important, um, yeah, you know, it's like the team, the. The, the the vision the um the work and basically like everybody at my company has ownership over the company you know like they feel such connection with the artists um and we try to keep it that way so people are inspired and i don't really i'm not like you got to be in at 9 a.m you got to leave a, i don't i don't have to say anything people come in at like when they want to come in but they're there till you know god knows what time and that's because they just they just love it and I can't be in a space where, like, if I see people are unhappy, I'm the first one to ask, like, yo, what's wrong? Like, what's, you know, are you having a bad day? Like, because yeah. I don't want to see people unhappy. So, um, the team is hand picked to, like, the, you know, the brim. And, um, we tried, it's a family, you know? Yeah. It's small, but it's a family. Absolutely. Yeah. How'd you discover Gallant? Um, I just want to get we, into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. We were um, at the studio with a bunch of people, and Azad played me. We were just playing songs for each other, and he played me the song um, from this kid that had just dropped like an EP or something online. And immediately, um, which is what I do every time I hear a song that like I feel like could use improvements, I'm like, yo, this is tight, but like, 
he should have done this or he should have done that, like all these different things about the music. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. And I was like, I'm going to reach out to this fool. He's to do it. So I reached out, and then he had a show the next week. And he's like, come see me play. I'm like, word. So I went and saw him play. Um, there was like three or four people in the room when I got there, literally at the bootleg theater in downtown. He was opening for Jarrell Perry, I think his name is. Um, and I saw him sing live. And I had never in my life felt that way about an artist's voice, voice live, including my favorite artist that I'd ever seen growing up and i i tripped because i was with my uh <coughs> my friend at the time and um i didn't really know if i was like having an emotional breakdown or if like it was actually that good <laughs> <laughs> so i stayed for the next i stayed for the next artist when i was supposed to go home just to compare it you know yeah and the other artists came out with production and you know all these things and gallant was just him like two guys on drums and uh key of guitar sorry and then a tv like in the corner that was his production and you didn't get this from the record no no and he came in a couple weeks later we kept talking after i saw him perform um and we had a night where he called me like two or three in the morning and he was like and this was the same day that he had come in and i basically ripped him on all the things i would have changed about what he's doing you know the music the the aesthetic the, the whole thing right he left like kind of pissed yeah i was gonna say how do you take that and he called me. He's like, he's like, you're my guy. And he still says it today. He's like, you know, when they ask him why did you sign a Moog, he was, you know, when I read his interview, he said it was because David told me everything I didn't want to hear. Incredible. And that was great. Absolutely. Yeah. Who are some of the other artists that are coming out under the Moog umbrella, and, and what are you most excited about for uh, 2017? I'm really excited for Dante and Drew from they. Um, they have a full project coming out. My that young we, hyenas. Yeah, we just it's finished. Really dope. Um, I'm really, really excited to get back in his studio with Gallant. Awesome. Um, to start recording for his second album and see where that goes. Um, I'm actually ecstatic about that now that I just said it. It's the first time I've actually said that. Awesome. Um, Zoo, obviously, will be recording again for his second album, um, which is always like a an amazing journey of like sounds and yeah, figuring that out man. and planning his next show. Um, Clang Stoff will be touring vigorously off the nice. back of the LP that we just put out. Um, and he just got confirmed for a really big festival next year, which I can't say, but awesome. Um, it's in the desert. Um, and <laughs> the, uh, and, Qu and we're introducing a new artist called Quay. I can't wait for that. And which you've obviously heard a lot about, yeah. um, who's been in incubation for two years. It's, it's insane and has one of the most inspiring stories that I think any artist can imagine having that's incredible that's awesome I have a just a side question for you Nushi yeah what's it been like to see the evolution of David it's been incredible I mean you know one of the things that that for me is that like we've always been so connected right and it's funny because the role that I played with Dave, like naturally I went on the road with him for a long time, but I feel like through that and just also me being very open with my skill sets and, 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 and my lack of them in certain areas, we really built a very special bond that was just beyond the role play. You know what I'm saying? Like I probably get a phone call from David, uh, you know, it used to be every day. And then now it's it's more like every other day or every few days of, of just like when he, he's driving. Like I feel like when David's walking his dog or he's driving <laughs> and he's going through these things in his head, like he'll hit me up. So it's been, it's been an incredible, to be honest, like I don't want to sound like a dick here, but like I knew this was, was, was I knew stardom not from the standpoint of like fame or whatever, but I knew that he he was going to become as great as he wanted to be. Well, both right? you know you and Azad both said that. Yeah, and, and you and, said and a lot of the, the guys not not to. <laughs> you know. No, but like I'd have conversations with his mom about it. You know what I'm saying? She'd be freaking right. out, pulling me to the side. You know what I'm saying? But I'd always have conversations with his mom about it, and and I remained steadfast in that belief. Right. Naturally, we go through life and we make decisions and, and, and our decisions dictate what happens. Um, but I never had a doubt about David uh, becoming 
as great as he wanted to be. Because there's certain people that just have a charisma about them. Not only did they have a charisma about him, but he was also very empathetic in, in, in a lot of degrees. He was he had a hustler's ambition, like your your favorite hustler's favorite hustler, right? So you put all of these types of things in in conjunction with his incredible music acumen, his lust for the music knowledge and his ear, you know, he he's gonna tell it to you how it is. You know, I, I look at it every day and I smile, you know what I mean? And we talk often, whether it's about this music shit or just about personal shit, like we're always there for one another. And, and I love that, you know what I mean? Like, The funny thing is, um, we talked about in the very beginning, like how I grew up, is when you, when you grow up, in, and you did too, Anoush, when you grow up in an environment where there's so many different classes of people, mm-hmm. you learn how to control the room. Um and sort of like adapt without having to change yourself. Yeah. So um, whether I'm in a room with, you know, it's funny the other day I had a random demo submitted to me for the fifth email in a row by this guy. And I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to go to these kids studios. Right. I showed up to the studio right here down the street, actually in a little tiny apartment where the studio said it was, it was actually my first time in a kid's studio in forever. And I went there simply just to, be in that room again with kids that are just making music yeah. not because I fell in love with the music but because I just wanted to give advice and like help guide and they were like you know so thankful and surprised that I showed up midday like they took off work that day to come early like so I can so I could come by and like I constantly am having to recalibrate and like re-grease certain wheels and I'm so cognizant of those things because if it wasn't for those things that got me here then I become jaded, you know? So I I try to stay um, as close to that as possible. And, um, you know, again, it's like you, you have to go through some shit to like be able to, like what he said, like really feel someone else's stuff. Um, And luckily the struggles that I went through younger, not knowing that they were going to be the reasons why I tried so hard or continue to try so hard to provide for myself and my future family and, you know, those around me. Um, but yeah, I mean, even someone like Anoush, you know, like people, and he meant, he said it right now, where he's like, he always knew in which he always, you know, had faith in me from the very beginning. But um, people just always like wanted to see me win for some reason. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, it was you weird. Need that though. It was weird. Like no one, like I was always the underdog. And it's always the best feeling being another dog because like, and that's why I can't drive a nice car or wear a nice watch because I feel like I don't, I can't, I always want to be the underdog and like, I never want to be flashy about the things that I've achieved Um, because then I'm not me anymore. Mm -hmm. And whether I'm 16 or 40, I still always want to be like the guy people are rooting for. Um, And that was always important to me. And you know, my family um, didn't always root for me, you know, like they wanted me to be successful, but didn't want me to do it in my own way. Yeah. And it's more a fear of like fear. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't because they didn't have anything against me, but they were always terrified. Yeah. I remember and, even my mom, like, you know, when David was going through his darkest time, like that was probably one of the darkest moments of my life. I actually used to ask myself, like, what made him want to keep me on? Cause like he'd ask me to like yo know, like take a little bigger role, and I just blatantly tell him like, bro, like dance music is not my thing. I'm completely fine with coming on the road and handling the responsibilities because I'm really good at that. But like, that's not my thing. And I'd always wonder in my head like, what the fuck is he keeping me on here for? And we'd always have like long talks about this shit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But he also knew and believed in me to a degree. You know what I'm saying? And 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 at the same time like knew that I just wasn't ready to make certain steps and we'd always talk about these things and then life happens you know what I'm saying fortunately for me like life happening for me and me hitting rock bottom in my life like probably like a year and a half or so later um, allowed me to blossom into into what I'm able to be doing well that's the coolest part about being rock bottom is you're never if you've been at the bottom you know that being at the top isn't that much different Yeah, you know it's like it's like when you're okay with the barest necessities, yeah. then you're never scared to go back. Yeah. You know, like I'm, dude, listen, if everything fucking dies tomorrow, 
and I'm stuck eating a cup of noodles and sharing a bathroom with a roommate and, you know, driving a hundred dollar a month car that I was driving for two years before I started the label, then life's, you know, I won't starve, you know? And I feel like if, like, if you're not going to starve, then just do it. That's why I'm not, I'm not for the starving artist. Yeah. Like, you know, you're not going to fucking starve. Make it work. Figure it out, you know, figure it out. Going back to something I asked you before, um, we started to, and we, we asked Azad about this and what's it like being Persian in the music industry and in, in terms of just the dynamic and, you know, when you talked about the Persian kid that you saw, you know, earlier today, right? how does that play a role in all this in, in from when you, how you grew up playing piano as a Persian kid being so deeply rooted in that music to being in the industry as successful as you are. Um, how does that tie into to this for you? I think culturally, um, I feel like I'm, I'm paving a little bit of ground for the kids that are younger than me, um, which is amazing, you yeah. know? So, and I hope that that pavement, all it says is do whatever the fuck you want to do and um, believe in yourself. And as opposed to going down the roads that we're told to go down. Yeah. Um, and that was always my struggle. I remember my sister, my older sister, leaving me a voicemail one night. Like, basically, I just hung up the phone on her because we had gone into an argument over what I was doing. And she's like, I still have the voicemail. It was, it was supposed to be the opening of my next album. And it's basically like her saying, I love you. I don't know why you're hanging up the phone on me. All I'm telling you to do is just have a plan B. And my album was called Plan B, the second one. And um, it's funny because she couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, I love her to death. (laughs) You know, but um, I encourage people to have no Plan B, right? You know, it's like... See how real Plan A is, though. Yeah, like, because the truth is if you try Plan A and you fail miserably, you'll at least find some light in the the fall and then find your next move. Sure. And um, that's why today I talk to everybody from the custodian up, you know, because you never know what lead that custodian has on something that may open up a door for you in some other aspect. Absolutely. So, and that's because I've, I've just always loved, um, I've always tried to see beauty in my own situations when they seem the darkest. So naturally I do that with others as well um, and try to find the best things, whether it's for selfish reasons for myself or for them but I always try to find the the light in certain situations. And you're not going to find the light in every situation, obviously. But yeah. um, manifestation is a real thing, you know. Like Respect. You put it out there and you want it bad enough and um, you put in the dedication and time, then there's sure as hell a door that's going to open up somewhere that's going to lead you. Um, but you got to know the difference and the reality of... Um, being optimistic and then knowing when to be like, okay, now it's time to turn left instead of just keep going Pistol. straight. I think a lot of people, you know, most people continue to go straight because a family member is telling them they're really good at it or, yeah. you know, they, they're they just getting not the realist, fo- the, the the right form of advice. Sure, sure. You know, because your mom or dad is going to tell you sometimes they love what you're doing, you should keep doing it because they love you and they don't want to hurt you. Yeah. I don't give a fuck, right? Like, if you're an artist and you're in my office playing me shitty music, I'm going to tell you I don't think it's good enough. Like you should probably go back and take vocal lessons or learn more how to program or whatever it is because I don't have any emotional connection to like your yeah. your personal being. Yeah. Like you're sitting in a room with me because you want me to tell you what I think. And that's hopefully what separates me from every other art, you know, executive is that my opinion matters to you. Absolutely. And, my and, it's, and it's honest. And it's honest. And I'm not looking at you like, <coughs> like my next check, but I'm looking at you more so as like a, as a, as a partner. Yeah. You know, cause and I, cause I, cause your music is a reflection of what I love. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy in an industry that's driven so much by this huge, massive fantasy. Right. You know, for so many artists. Um, I always say the music industry is so crazy. I think maybe entertainment across the board, but it's like, you know the odds are against you. You know how hard it is. You know 
almost everyone that you love has probably failed at some point. Right. It's super short lived. And this is from the perspective as an artist, but you're willing to just fuck it, give everything up for it. That's such a weird, it's always been like a weird dynamic to me. Even like when, when, you know, when I was a musician too, it's like that dynamic from being an artist to being in this business when you know all odds are against you and you know, some driven by that fantasy or some driven by that hope. What do you think just the most like real thing you can tell someone right now about being stepping into this industry as an artist and in terms of like, in terms of what to expect and if they're really going to try to make it and do this. Right. Well, first off, artists are um, one of the most c- courageous types of human beings out there. Right. So, I mean, self-expressing just off top is yeah. something that people take therapy and classes for to learn how to become better at, you yeah. know. So you're already one step in at that point. Um my second piece of advice is surround yourself with somebody who has an unbiased opinion um, about what you're doing and isn't giving you an opinion because of the wrong relationship type that you have with them. So I, I know from my experience, there's just plenty of artists that just have too many yes men around them. So sure. the stuff never comes that good. For sure. Um, you know, like we don't, again, we're very unfiltered and blunt and um, to a fault. You know, we've been in rooms where, like, with huge corporations, as Odd and I, where we've, like, ripped their philosophies and what they're about. And then in hopes that we're going to get a consulting gig or something at the end of it. But, <laughs> it. but in reality, we just, like, you know, tore this company to shreds because we don't think that what they're doing is right. You know, yeah. so, um, again, it's it's just surrounding yourself with honest opinions and honest people. And, and as DJ Khaled says, uh, clean souls. You know, which is true. You know, you need clean souls around For sure. You. Love, bro. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Oh, incredible, man. It, was I, it better like, than the first one? Round two. Oh, no, yeah. this, this is just another form. Yeah, just another form. It's yeah. like, I, f- I think the first one needed to happen, was like, for, at least for me, because yeah. I had to get that out of the way. Now I could like really feel and, yeah. and see, see yeah, into yeah. your story more. I hope you guys put the marketing dollars behind this one. You know, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 see that it turned it back on i love yeah. you cool no, thank you guys. thank you so much for coming right, on man thank you seriously for me. I, I think you're you're a massive inspiration to a lot of people thank you um i hope you, so no i think what you're doing is is incredible for this industry um and for music in general thank I, you i really do believe Absolutely. that thank you so thank you i appreciate it thank you guys for having me yeah man mama we, we made, made.